Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, and good to see everybody's smiling faces here today. I uh, want to pray for Pastor Lewis and Terry. They're heading to Ireland on Tuesday for a couple weeks getaway to spend time over there um, drinking the uh, Irish beer, and um, <laughs> I'm sp- spreading rumors about them. But anyway, they're going to be there watching their son play in the basketball finals over there. So pray that they'll have an awesome time, safe time, refreshing time, and pastor will come back and start teaching again in April. So I have the month of March, and you have to put up with me until he comes back in April. So uh, we're in the book of Romans today, chapter 8, if you have your Bibles. And uh, open your Bibles. Let me say a prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for today and the beauty, Lord, of this uh, new season we're entering into. Longer days, we're grateful for more daylight and longer days that helps our moods, our emotions. And um, Lord, we, we're grateful this week later on. I think you, the weather guys said it was going to be in the 70s, and that is really exciting, Father, because spring is really going to be sprung upon us. And we ask, Lord, that your word this morning, once again, would uh, do what it does. It's so powerful, and it causes us to see our lives change by the power of your Holy Spirit. Um, it, it's fascinating to just through the hearing of the word and listening to it, how it gives us different perspective in our lives and how we live in the world that we're in today. It takes away anxieties. It takes away fears. It, it gives us faith to believe you and to trust you, Lord, for impossible situations. Uh, Lord, you're, you're the one that loves us and blesses us and cares for us and nurtures us and feeds us, Lord, spiritually. As we eat food daily to stay strong physically, you give us the word of God that we might be fed spiritually and be able to stay strong in the spirit. So, Lord, bless everyone you've brought here today. Uh, Give them a a good time in you, Lord, as they hear your spirit speak to their hearts, independent of me. And, Lord, I just pray you do a work, encourage where there needs to be encouragement. Lord, um, strength where there needs to be strength, hope where there needs to be hope, peace where there may be is anxiety, Um, presence where there might be fear, that they would know, Lord, that you're with us and you'll never leave us or forsake us. So, Lord, again, thank you for the body of Christ, everyone you brought here today. We're all part of your family, Lord, and we're here uh, to do life together and to, first of all, love you and to love one another. So, again, God, we're, we're just so grateful for who you are and how you work in our lives, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, we didn't get through too much. I started in verse 18, for, it's, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time, and I sort of hung out on that for a while, and we talked about what suffering's like and what we can go through as people at times in our lives. And we're all in different uh, periods, I guess, or seasons of life uh, that affect us all differently. Uh, lots of times it's based upon our age and also upon um, our own personal experiences in life. And so Paul's writing to the uh, Roman believers and uh, those in that part of the world at the time, and he's talking about suffering. And, and suffering is something that we don't like to encounter or think about or experience, but it's part of life. And suffering is allowed by God to cause us to go, go deeper in our faith with the Lord. Uh, many of us could give a testimony today on how suffering, as we look upon it in retrospect now after we've been through it, how we can see how God's used it to form who we are today and how we live and how we act and how we uh, experience uh, life every day with, with the Lord. And times of trials and times of suffering, thank God, they don't always last a super long time, usually, but um, sometimes they can. But God uses suffering to get our attention, uh, to cause us to step back a little bit and reflect on our lives and, and really start to talk to him maybe in a little deeper way, like, Lord, why is this going on? Or why is this happening? Or can this change? Or can you get me out of this particular situation right now that I'm in that I, I just don't like? And as we're interacting with God, he's able to communicate to us uh, his purpose in allowing suffering. 
Not so much in the idea of causing suffering, but allowing suffering in a human experience. And so it humbles us. It causes us to depend on God more. It increases our faith, especially when we see him come through for us after the suffering. And then also it gives us the ability to help other people when they're suffering. We can enter into their experiences and, and tell them we know what they're going through. We've been there. Or we are there. And it comforts other people because they don't feel alone. As a matter of fact, Paul says in another section of Scripture that the suffering that's in our lives is allowed so that we might be able to comfort others when they suffer. And that's a blessing. If you haven't been through challenging times, how can you really talk to people about maybe what they're going through if you haven't gone through something yourself. And so, as I said last week, when Paul wrote this, you know, he's writing this from a perspective of, of really challenging times. He was in prison for preaching the gospel. He was beaten. Um, he was slandered. I mean, I could go on and on about the experiences that this guy had as, a, as an apostle, uh, when I read his sufferings and what he went, he, he went through, I, I'm, I'm thankful I'm not an apostle and I wasn't called to be an apostle. Uh, I'm, I can learn from what he went through, but I certainly don't want to have to uh, replicate or duplicate what he went through. But I can learn by reading how he handled what he went through in my own life as a, as a Christian. And so he's writing this First of all, as I said last week, from a very deep perspective of his relationship with God. He wasn't superficial. He wasn't like in and out of the faith. I mean, he was all in all the time. All in all the time in his faith and his love for Christ. So I don't think there's anybody in this room that, you know, is at that level, I guess, of, of zealousness or commitment. And that's not a put down. It's just the reality that he was called to be who he was, an apostle of God. And because of that, he, he went through a lot of stuff for our sake so that we could read about how to handle life today because of what he went through. And so he's writing it from a, a deep perspective of his relationship with the Lord. And he says, I consider that the suffering of the present times are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So Paul was an optimist. He never was negative. He was always like, hey, there's better days that are coming. We're going to get through this. Christ is capable and able to get us out of whatever it is we're going through that is difficult. And he knew by experience in his own life that God never let him down. And, and most of us here today, we know that too. Sometimes we feel like maybe we're in a season where God maybe has let us down, but he never lets us down. Sometimes he doesn't get back to us right away when we call upon him and we ask him for help and we wonder why we have to wait, but there's a purpose in all that too. And so he's talking about this glory that's going to be revealed in us for the earnest expectation of verse 19 of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So when you look at nature and trees and everything that God's created and planet and stars and sun and moon, you can look at all that every day and you can sort of take it for granted because it's always there and you just expect it to be there. But there's this dimension of what God has planned in the days ahead that's going to far exceed anything you can see on your best day right now in regard to God's physical manifestation of what he created the sun, the earth, the moon, the stars, the seas, the waters, the flowers, the vegetation, the animals, the human race. It's, it's just the beginning of what he has intended to reveal to us. And I, I use this verse many, many times. Uh, you know, it's one of my life verses. And I have not seen nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man, the things that God hath prepared for those who love him. The, the best is yet to come for all of us. And, and it, it's good right now, isn't it? But can you imagine it being better than it is right now? Our minds can't be wrapped around that idea because we, we just can't anticipate, I guess, in the degree that God has planned 
for what he has waiting for you and me as his kids because he loves us. And he can't wait to reveal to us what he has in store for us. You ever think like at Christmas time, you get a special gift for someone you love and you can't wait till they see it, till they open it, till they experience it. And sometimes you want to give them hints a little bit ahead of time so they, they're anticipating it and they're, they're like, come on, tell me what it is. Can't you, can't you show me now? No, no, you got to wait till Christmas morning, right? And that's sort of the way it is for us right now. We're waiting and, and God's revealing things little by little to give us little anticipation or inklings of what is yet to come on the horizon. And it comes from the teaching of the Word of God. And so he's, he's so excited about revealing one day this new human race that he initially created to be like him that isn't like him until people come to faith in Jesus Christ and we then begin to become a little bit more like God's intended creation, right? But there'll, there'll come a day where he's going to reveal a new dimension of life where everybody's going to be like the Lord. We're going to have the same character. The, 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 he said, when you see him, you'll see him as he is, for you shall be like him, for you shall see him as he is. There'll be a day you're going to be just like Jesus. No flaws, no sin. Um, physically, I don't know, it, 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 whatever the year is of your life that you're the most good looking and the most virile and the, you, know, you have hair in your head and there's no gray and there's no pot bellies and there's no, and all this stuff that happens to us as we age. We're going to have these new, like perfect human bodies. And not only that, we're going to see streets of gold and we're going to see uh, the, the gates of, of, of the kingdom and we're going to see Jesus sitting on the throne and, and we're going to see all the loved ones that went before us that are now uh, in, in the image, total created image and likeness of God in the eternal state where there'll be no more death, no more dying, no more crying, no more fighting, no more wars, no more politics, no more disease. I mean, it's perfect. It almost sounds too good to be true, right? But it is true. And, and he's writing about it. And it's even more in clarity in the book of Revelation when you read what he has planned and how he, he specks out the dimensions of the, the, the New Jerusalem and the city and the streets and how everything. And the women will love it because the jewelry up there is going to be unbelievable. I mean, the stones and the, the, all the different colors and the, the beauty. And the, I mean, you know, you think jewelry's good on this side of heaven. Wait till you get to heaven. So he has this all prepared. In verse 20, he says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willing, but willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into this glorious liberty of the children of God. So right now we're in, uh, the, the, the scientific term is entropy. Everything is like deteriorating or decaying slowly. Uh, the resources of, of this present world uh, are in the process of being depleted. Now, there's still a lot of oil and there's still a lot of stuff, uh, you know, to still get us through for a long time. But, but there's a limitation to what this particular present world has to offer because of, of sin and, and the destruction that man does to the resources and the environments and wasting them and all that kind of stuff. But more personally, entropy is affecting you and me, right? Like, if you look in the mirror and you're... 30 today, you look still pretty good. If you're 40, you still look pretty good. If you're 50, you start like, yeah. 60, it's starting to go downhill. 70, believe me, it's not the same as it was when you were 20, right? So you realize like there's a limitation to the strength and the, um, our, our ability, our, you know, our recognition of what we think we look like versus what we really look, look like, right? And as we're, as we're older, a lot of us look in a mirror sometimes and we say, like, who is that person in that mirror? I, I, don't, I don't recognize that person, right? And then you look at a picture of yourself like when you were in your 20s and 30s and say, boy, I look pretty good then, you know? 
I look pretty hot or whatever. And then all of a sudden, you're like, man, those days just go by so quick, right? And, and then, and then your, your, your physical frame, you're, you're, you're walking maybe, and you're going up a hill, and, and you're like, why am I puffing? Or why am I legs sore? When I used to, like, when I was younger, I'd run up that hill, and there'd be no issues with, you know, how I was able to do it. So this, this idea of entropy, and um, I had the privilege yesterday of hanging out with a guy, getting to know him a little bit, and a, a remarkable person. Um, he's my age, um, and his physical frame is, is failing him, and he's having some health, health issues and difficulties, and, and he's thinking about his life. He's reflecting on the past and, and regrets, as we all do, and things he wished he would have done differently when his kids were little and more time spending with them. And he told me, I wish I would have got him more involved in the church. And, and, and he said, they all turned out good. But, you know, he has these thoughts about, about life. And um, he said, Clark, I, I got these 17 acres, and I used to be able to go out there and work all day long and do yard work, and, and he's a hunter, and, you know, he's got all these, like, different things he killed up on the wall, and uh, different deer and pheasants and that kind of stuff. And, and, and he's reflecting on now where he's at and what he can't do anymore. So we went outside, and we were just talking about life, and... Uh, and he had a few cigarettes, and I had to stand back a little bit because I was, like, choking on the smoke coming out. And he was, like, one, at, one right after another. But I used to smoke, so I know what it was like. But, uh, but anyway, he, he opened up his heart about life, and we were talking about, like, what's on the other side. And he told me some fascinating stories about his own faith development and, and how he came to uh, believe. He said, I always knew there had to be a God. And I always knew there had to be something better than what we're experiencing now. And then, you know, we talked about some verses that confirm that. <clears throat> but he also said that what turned him off is that, and John, you would appreciate this, he was in the Navy. So he was on a destroyer, a small ship, not an aircraft carrier. And these guys were in the seas around Vietnam at the time, very dangerous, very dangerous and scary. And they didn't have a chaplain on the small boats. They just had them on the big boats. So there happened to be a believer um, that was on the uh, small destroyer with him that said, hey, you know, we don't have any pastor here or anything, but I'd be willing to have a Bible study on Sundays if you guys wanted to come up. So he said about 10 or 12 of them would go up, and there was, there was no big room except where they had the, uh, the uh, what do you call those um, things, John, that they, they shoot out of the submarine. What's that thing called? Torpedoes, that's right, thank you. He was, he was a naval guy. And these were like lethal torpedoes that could wipe out a lot of stuff really super fast. And so they were in this room with these torpedoes and they'd have this Bible study and, and talk about the Lord and, and, and verses. And, and he said, Clark, there wasn't a day that went by that I wasn't crying out to God for safety. I feared for my life. And he said he had to strap himself in at night to sleep because the seas were so rough and so difficult but it kept him calm. And uh, so we, we just talked about life, but, but this entropy, there's nothing that can change the fact that his health, as mine and everybody else, has a certain limitation. And he realizes he can't do what he used to do, so he's trying to moderate how he does things. And, um, and it's sad because it's, it's part of life. We, we get older. Uh, we, we eventually die, and are we prepared to eventually die? None of us want to think about dying, but we're to be prepared to meet our maker, basically, all of us, no matter what age we are, we're, to have peace in our soul and to know that Jesus is our Savior and that when we leave this life, um, it's going to be awesome. Not that we're wanting to leave now, but it, it's not a negative, right? It's not a negative, and this is what Paul's teaching us here about these things regarding this present time of difficulty in life. So he says, uh, we know in verse 22 that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. So not only are, are, is the anticipation of the human race um, being prepared to be made ready for this new heaven and new earth that's going to be established in this world one day, the new heaven and the new earth, this one will not be here anymore, that 
Creation itself is, is like, the, the Greek word was like, it's like on tiptoe. You're, like, you're trying to look around the corner. You know, there's big parade and all these floats and all this cool stuff going on. Or, you know, the celebration of Super Bowl and they have the parades and they're, hey, I want to see if I can see my homes. You know, and when's he coming down or whatever. And, and, and this anticipation of, of, of this e- major event in time and history that, that will occur. But even creation itself is groaning. The trees reach out for the spring and life again. And the trees, God's created these, these things that he's made, uh, even volcanoes that are stirring and then all of a sudden they start erupting. You know, when will this new uh, experience uh, come, to, come to pass? And, and it's fascinating that there's these birth pangs until now. I asked Nick this morning, how's Ruby? And Ruby's ready to deliver twins. And she can't, I said, how's, how's Ruby doing? She's not happy. <laughs> She's jammed, man, her stomach. And she can't, two, two little babies coming. And, and he said, 13 days maybe. So keep, keep that family in prayer and safe delivery for Ruby. But this, the, the birth pangs, the, the mother knows that when those pangs start happening, she's going ha- to be able to release and give birth. And then she's going to have relief. Well, that's sort of what is happening in the whole universe right now. These birth pangs are occurring, and there's this anticipation of, of relief for the, the new heaven and the new earth. So you have creation that's groaning. Not only that, but we also, in verse 22, 23, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So... Creation's groaning, and I, I said last week briefly that I get up sometimes, and I, the first thing I start doing, I don't, I don't even think about it. I'm groaning. Oh, another day, I got to get, oh, I got to do this, I got to do that. All right, where's the coffee? Get the coffee, you know, and after a couple cups of coffee, I'm not groaning as much. I'm more positive, I guess I may be, but uh, it, it's a challenge, you know, and as you get older, your body doesn't jump out of bed as quickly as it did when you were a kid. You get out, and boy, my back's sore, and my legs, you know, why am I so tight? Why am I so stiff? But it's, it's built into us to have this, this groaning. We all know what that's like, um, and, and then he says, for we, in verse 24, we're saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await for it with perseverance. So it's like um, we all have dreams and ambitions and desires and plans and goals and all these things in life, right? And it's fun to have things to anticipate. I like to have something to look forward to, don't you? I mean, life, if you didn't have anything to look forward to every day, it would be like pretty boring. But God gives us a lot of things that we can um, experience to look forward to. I think of the Eichelberger family, they're going to be having a wedding at the end of, the, end of May. And, and, and Stevie, he's, he, that's all he's thinking about, right? He's anticipating that wedding with his, his bride-to-be. And the family's looking forward to that celebration. That's something to look forward to. I look forward to the last week of uh, August and first week of September because I'm at the beach for two weeks. I'm thinking about it. I'm looking forward to it. I'm anticipating it. I'm anticipating the, the lunch after church, you know, and I'm anticipating, you know, whatever. And you guys have those things too. It's a wonderful thing to be able to anticipate. And sometimes what you're anticipating may be something for the first time you've never experienced. Maybe it's a new job opportunity or maybe it's a new breakthrough and something that's going to help your health. Or maybe it's a relationship of a, a guy for a gal or a gal for a guy that you, you know, you have, you're interested in and you're wondering what it's going to look like down the road. Or maybe it's the new car you're thinking about getting. Or maybe, you know, it could be a host of things that you have something that you want to look forward to. And so God builds these things into our life and he gives us this opportunity to have faith to see something sometimes to a certain extent, even though we really can't see it clearly right now. And, and the, the new heavens and the new earth is somewhat subjective because how do we like really get into it in our minds and in our heart and our spirit to, to be excited about it? And it's even like for people that don't know the Lord yet, that haven't experienced what we have in, in regard to new life. Um, the Bible says that those who come to God must first believe that he is. 
That's the first step. Is there a God? They have to first believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So God even puts in our hearts and our spirit this desire to want to know who he is. He's the one that draws us. He's the one that works in us to cause us to be curious, to ask questions, to reflect, to wonder, and then to um, eventually, by his grace, believe and trust in him. It's a beautiful thing uh, of, of God developing faith in us and giving us faith to trust him, especially in times that are difficult. Like the guy said in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And there's times that we struggle with our faith and our belief. But God's able to give us something that we don't have in, our, in and of ourselves. And he gives us this, this hope. How, how can someone have hope when the, the diagnosis is, uh, is deadly and uh, there's no, uh, no hope at all? Uh, all you guys know Matt Scott, and he gave his testimony. He, he preached a message on having terminal cancer and how he's dealing with a uh, life-besetting uh, illness right now. And uh, he, he texted me yesterday. He said his PSA is up again, 4.66. So it keeps going up. It's not going down. But he, you know what he says? I, I sent him a text. I said, I'm teaching on Romans 8, 18 to 28. What's your personal perspective in this time of your life? This guy's got a terminal cancer, and he knows he's going to die. And I asked him, like, how is he handling this right now? And this is his response. God is good. His mercies are new every day. He is a hope I hold on to no matter what comes. Though he slay me, I will always trust in him. Whatever his will is, nothing outweighs what he has done for me. Isn't that something? And he's anticipating, even though he doesn't want to leave his sweetie behind, Anita, he, he's anticipating what the Lord has for him. And so we, we read these things and we it says we're to wait with perseverance. In other words, we don't give up. We don't stop. We don't get negative. We don't get bummed out. We don't get depressed. We just keep pressing on. I don't understand, but I trust God. Amen? I don't understand, but I'm going to keep looking to him. I'm going to keep asking him. I'm going to keep depending on him. And then it says in verse 26, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So like sometimes you're in a situation like you just don't know how to pray. I've been there and I'm sure you have been too. I'm so thankful I don't have to make it up or try to force myself to say something to God that will get his attention. I can just say, God, I don't know how to deal with this right now. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to get through this. And then rely on the Holy Spirit who's praying. I can't hear him pray, but he's, he's God, God the Holy Spirit. He's continually interceding for you and me in ways we don't even know. And he's setting it up for your good. His prayers are designed to bring blessing into your life and bring resolution and bring answers, not to destroy you or not to put you down or not to discourage you. He, he's this God that's in you internally by the power of the Holy Spirit that's communicating your deepest emotions, your feelings, your thoughts that you can't even articulate in such a way that it makes sense to the Father and then the, the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are working out the will of God for your life. And how awesome is that? You don't have to feel like you've got to talk to God and tell him what's going on. He already knows, doesn't he? We're told to pray and make our requests known to God all the time, but sometimes, you know, it's not working for us. But God's praying anyway for you and me, even when we can't. I'm so comforted by that. And so, he says in verse 28, and this is a huge, life-changing verse. It says, and we know 
that all things work together for good to those who love God. Everything's working together for good. Even what's bad is working together for good. And when, when we're going through things that aren't good, they're bad, we're like, how in the world can this be good? In, in, in the immediate situation, it doesn't seem to be good, but if you have time and longevity in life where you can look back and see certain things that occurred that were horrific and difficult, and you can say many times, now I see what God's plan was in that. What brought us back to this area from Philadelphia was not a good thing. When we came back here, we were heartbroken as a family. But yet, in time, and it took some time, it took some years, I didn't go to church for six years because of what I had been through. Wasn't so much mad at God. I was just messed up, not understanding why, what happened, happened, whatever. And now I look, and I've been a pastor now for 28 years. And God used something that wasn't good to call me into serving him. And I have the privilege of seeing your delightful faces every Sunday morning, sleeping, <laughs> smiling, texting, whatever you're doing. But it's a privilege to see Christ work in your lives and change your lives and to give you a calling in your life, a purpose that's bigger than yourselves to, to live for Jesus and to follow him. I'm sure you can look in your own lives and look at circumstances and situations that occurred that look back, man, that was not good, but now you can see how God used it for good because for those of us who belong to him, everything is working together for good. To who? To those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. So aren't you glad that what's happening, there's a purpose for it because you love him and you know him? He's working every situation out. For whom he foreknew, he knew you before you were born. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God had a plan for you and me that we would be conformed into the image and likeness of Jesus little by little. And you guys, and including me, we're all becoming like, like Jesus a little bit more every day. I was talking to my daughter yesterday about something, an experience of how I was in a situation in a, in a, in a restaurant and how I already reacted because of bad service in a very arrogant and rude and condescending mad way because the, the, the people weren't doing what they were supposed to do and bringing the meal to your table. You ever have that? Like, what's wrong with these people? <laughs> why are they messing up the meal or why, you know? So I, I, t I talked to the... Um, waiter, and I, I was somewhat like, this, this has got to be taken care of. And he said, well, I'm sorry, this is non-negotiable. And I said, well, then your tip's going to be non-negotiable. <laughs> I, was like, like, I was like, what am I saying here? I said, Can you just get the manager, get the owner. So the guy comes over, and instead of me, like, flipping out and saying, like, what's going on? Why are you guys, this is a big, expensive dinner, or whatever. I said, hey, can, can you sit down for a minute? And at first he looked at me, and he thought, okay. He sat down, and we had this nice conversation. His wife's an engineer. She was in Pittsburgh at a convention, and he asked where I was staying. I said, oh, I was at the Hampton Inn. He says, yeah, we go up to New England. We have relatives up there. We stay at the Hampton. They're nice. They're always clean and predictable, and, you know, the, the food, the breakfast in the morning is nice. And we just had a nice conversation. I said, hey, it's not about this... Uh, this Perrier bottle that they gave me that was like that big that I only need a half. I wanted to have a cap on it to take with me. They had no caps. I said, well, like, charge me for half of it. And, you know, I was like, what's, what's going on? He said, well, we do have caps, but they, the guy threw the caps away. You know, you ever work in a restaurant, you're just like trying to get people in and out. You're not thinking about like, I don't know, sometimes quality control or whatever. But I was so thankful because I was able to, to sit there and be calm that's not like Clark. That's the Lord. Believe me, anybody who knows Clark, I'm not that way. <laughs> Type A, man, it's got to be done right, you know, <laughs> or else. <laughs> but, you know, God's working on my heart and, and chipping off the rough edges and making me more gracious little by little. 
And so it, it, what, what could have been a real bad testimony, and of course they wouldn't have known I was a pastor or whatever, but the Lord knows, like, Clark, what are you doing, you know? <laughs> what are you acting that way for? So, and then the, then the uh, young guy came over, a gay guy, he was uh, the waiter, and uh, he was sort of flighty and a little nervous, and I said, hey, you know, I said, your, your boss said you have quirks, and he said, yeah, I didn't know that. I said, well, we learn something every day, you know, and, and, and then I said, well, is this what you're doing for your life? And he says, no, I just got through nursing school, and uh, I'm going to be a critical care uh, nurse in the uh, emergency room in the hospital down the road, you know, and he shared his life with me. And, and then I was able to, to bless him and, and give him a nice tip and, you know, and, and leave. And I got in the car and it was just like, I, I was thinking of this teaching this week. You know, he's conforming us to the image and likeness of his son. And that's exciting, isn't it? When you know he's changing your life. And we're all works in process. It takes a long time to change. But he's really true to his word. He is making us more like Christ. And so I love it in the fact that it says that those he called and he calls us to himself, he justifies us. In other words, he, none of us are perfect. And I had this conversation with my friend yesterday. And he had a humility like he has this idea of three rows. Like the first row is going down to hell and, and like, you know, a highway to hell. They're, like they're, they're not thinking about anything but themselves and sin and messing around. And, and so they're, they're like heading down to the abyss. The Bible says there's a, there's a way that seems right to man, but the way there is is a way of death. So that there's the cliff and the, and the majority of human race is, is, is walking off the cliff into the, the pit of hell. And then, then the, the, second, uh, the second row is, is people that are humbled and realize that they're not perfect and, and somehow, you know, they're not good enough to get into heaven on their own merit, which no one is when we're really honest. But there's this element of humility in the sense that like, why would God let me go into heaven? Because I'm no better than the people that are going to go off the cliff. Well, the only difference with me and the cliff people is, is that God in his grace showed me that I was a sinner and I could acknowledge my sin and admit that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior and, and ask God for mercy. He worked in my heart by His Spirit to give me the light to understand I'm lost and I need to be saved, right? That's what happened to a lot of us here today. But down deep inside of times, though, I think, who am I that God would do this for me? But He loves us and He justifies us. He makes us like himself. So he gives to us his righteousness that we could never earn and we don't deserve, but he, it's a gift. He takes my sin and gives me his righteousness and accepts me. The Father accepts me based upon what Jesus has done for me. That's why we need a Savior, right? And so it says, what then shall we say to these things as we conclude? All these things that Paul wrote. What can we say to these things? Awesome, right? This is awesome, right? This is awesome. <laughs> is it? This is truly awesome. What can we say to these things? Praise God, right? Awesome. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for you and me, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? This is a merciful, patient, loving, gracious God, our Father. He wants to lavish upon you all his goodness, all his grace, all his blessings. So who shall bring a charge against God's elect? If you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus and you believe in him, you're born again, people can say whatever they want to say about you. It doesn't matter because God knows you and he feels a certain way about you independent of what anybody else thinks or says. 
No one can charge you with anything because Jesus took it all upon himself. It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? Christ isn't condemning us. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God doesn't condemn. It is Christ who died, and furthermore, he is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So not only is God the Holy Spirit interceding for you and me, but Jesus is on the throne, and he's praying all the time, help this guy out with his attitude. Help this marriage out. Help this poor person is struggling with cancer right now. Help these people in Gaza. Help these people in Ukraine. Help these people at the border. Help these guys that are trying to lead the country that are just making a mess of things. God's always praying. Help these people turn. Turn to me. Turn to me. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? I love this section. And, and if you heard nothing else today, read these things yourselves. Get a highlighter. Uh, underline them in your Bible. What's going to separate you from the love of Jesus? Shall tribulation, meaning the toughest things in life, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, and Paul's writing about this, what he went through, as it is written, for your sake, we're killed all day long, we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are victors. We're overcomers, we're conquerors. I mean, this should give us such a sense of security, right, and stability because of what Christ has done for us. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers nor things present, nor things <coughs> to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you guys from this love. There's the devil will lie to you. He'll put things in your head. You'll think you're separated. It's a lie. Go to Romans 8 and review this in times of stress and trial and difficulty and when you're, when you're overwhelmed about life or whatever. Read these things. Study them. Memorize them. Remind yourself of these things. And also let other people know when they're going through tough times. They know the Lord. Let them know the promises that God's made for them. Romans chapter 8 is uh, known as the worship team can come forward as the most powerful chapter in the whole Bible. We took our time to go through it, but we just scratched the surface. We barely got into it. It's, it there's so much more. But this chapter, if you get into it and you study it and you embrace it and you uh, really uh, allow God to put it in your heart, it, it's life-changing, isn't it? It's life-changing. So let's prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. So we just take a couple minutes here personally, um, quietly before the Lord and talk to him about these things we've studied today and we've heard and we've considered. Asking the Lord, first of all, to make these things real and living to us, just not words on paper or words that a voice uttered this morning, but something much deeper that God has spoken to each of us by his Holy Spirit through his word. Lord, help me to grasp this. Help me to experience it. Help me to live it. Help me to really depend on it. And the Lord will intervene and work in amazing ways as you give God opportunity to, um, to do something in your heart.
If you're here today and you're struggling with faith or believing, you can be honest with God and say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. If you're burdened for someone that you care about and you love that is struggling and you want to be able to be used by God to help them, ask the Lord to use you with these verses, especially those ending verses in Romans 8. Maybe this week someone will need to hear these things. And you don't even know it yet, but you'll be in a circumstance this week where someone will open up or say something to you and you'll have a chance to bring hope to someone as a witness for Jesus. So let's just ask the Lord to deal with us for a little bit and then we'll take the supper. Lord, we love you today. And we're so thankful for who you are and all that you've done for us and all that you continually do for us, Lord. There's no one like you in the whole universe. You alone are God. And we worship you today, each of us, Lord, in our own way. We come to you, Lord, as this mere mortal people, human beings, Lord, flawed and yet loved on by you. We're so thankful, Lord, for your patience with us and the promises, Lord, that you give us in your word that you are working everything together for our good, Lord. And that, Lord, you're using life and circumstances, challenges, adversities, good things, bad things, whatever, Lord, you're using them all to make us more like you, which is your ultimate desire and plan and we're thankful that we know that's happening in our lives Lord it's, it's a slow process but we know it's happening and we're grateful and we yield Lord we surrender to you this morning just to have your way with us Lord give us grace Father that um, we might just be more excited about our relationship with you that it's a living relationship it's not a religion it's not a ritual it's a friendship with you, Lord. You with us and us with you. So, Lord, as we take this supper, we take it in celebration of what it is you've done that makes us more than conquerors through you who love us. Your death, your burial, your resurrection, and your soon coming, we celebrate and we remember. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread in his hands and he broke it and he gave thanks and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which was given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. In the same manner in that evening he took the cup. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood which is shed for the forgiveness of sins of many. Drink this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death till he comes again. One last announcement I wanted to make. The, the pastor's conference in Philadelphia is May 20th, 21st, and 22nd. So we leave Monday on the 20th in the morning and come back Wednesday on the afternoon. If any of you men who are here feel like God's calling you into ministry or service or some sort of whatever that he has planned for you, Please see me after church, and I'd like to tell you about it and uh, invite you to come along. We have, I think, about nine guys right now that are coming, but uh, I don't want to miss anybody in case. Uh, don't, no pressure. And, you know, you don't, no one has to go to this, but sometimes you feel like God's calling your way to something for a specific purpose in your life, so I want to make that available to you guys, okay? So love you guys. Have a great day. God bless.